<clears throat> hey folks. How long is the final going to be? About 24 inches. Um, eight and, yeah, eight and a half by 11. I, yeah, I like a homework. I, it's not as quite so long as a midterm. Try to keep it reasonable. Is that be okay? It'll be take home. Um, cool. So, <clears throat> What, what days are final? I'm sorry. Uh, take home. What day? Oh, so it's gonna be a few days to do it. Yes. Yep. 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 Um, I will try to have it available over the weekend. Um, and do before the end of finals so that I can have time to grade it along with lots of other things. Um. Is this the last week of class for everyone except Derek? Yes. Oh, no. For Yes. This is the last week of class. I know. It's strange. No. Yeah. Is he saying no to it being the last week of class or to it not being the last week for him? <laughs> um, so here, we're with Camille joining. We'll be just one person short. Jacob. Um, I just I'm going to start writing down like a recap um, where we were right. Oh, that's really odd. All right, that doesn't look right. So uh, we're going to today keep talking about um, uh, the this taking a look. Uh, what I'm going to do after the semester ends. Yeah, for life in general. Because I don't know. Yeah. What was that? Did someone do that or did I do that? I think I did that. Um, cool. Um, yeah. So l let's take a look here um, at what we were doing. We were looking at the way that um, just the microscopic mechanics. Yeah, this this is what takes up most of our time. Yeah, finding what to do after this is going to be important. Um, and. Uh, no, don't ingest disinfectants. Don't inject them either, or whatever it was that was said. Um, don't try to get them into the body with strong, strong exposure, or whatever the quote was. Eternal taint, light in the skin, light in the skin. Yeah. Now, I have, uh, well, for one thing, I think we'll probably keep doing so, uh, some of the physics teas with the physics professors, just like it's a way for us to like kind of touch base. Um, but beyond that, yeah, I'm not sure. I keep hearing more and more uh, internships that cancel, um, so I'm, I'm really at a loss too. Um, I'm not sure that my summer fellowship's going forward uh, and stuff like that. So we shall see. Good times. Yeah, I think we'll keep trying to do that over the summer. Yeah, it's you know just a few minutes, time to get together, stuff like that. Cool. Who? Uh, what? What are you going to do after this? Who's that addressed to? The whole class, or just to me? Doctor Grossman. Yeah. Um. I. So the originally. Uh, hold on, there's something weird going on here. Um, originally, I was going to be working uh, in the Navy lab where uh, Harry is, um, and that, but that's funded through like a kind of an external part of the the Navy, and that is still up in the air um, whether I'll be able to whether they'll allow that to to go ahead. Um, and that was just for the summer, and then. Um, I had fellowships that I apply for for during the year, which I, I didn't get. So I'm going to be doing some writing. I'm going to be doing some uh, training myself with UAS is and getting ready to do some uh, variations on the project that Luke was doing, uh, Luke Quinn with UAS for archaeology stuff like that. 
Um, but yeah, a little more free time. Going to be, I'm on the Committee on Education for the American Physical Society, and I may take over as chair come January. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. It's, it's, but it, things are changing. Uh, being taught by a celebrity. Yeah, right. Subject matter expert, SME. Am I writing with my left foot? It probably looks like it. It's about that that organ that the handwriting is about that good, right? Um, yeah. Right, so we were looking at our electrons being driven by the electric field, having a restoring force that's the binding force. So like a harmonic oscillator, um, there's damping force, right, from radiation. Right, and so we wrote all that together and looked at the position of the electron as a function of time um, and wrote out, an equation of motion that gave our acceleration, a damping term, our binding term with a resonant frequency, and a driving term with this the oscillating field of an, a wave passed by the electron on the atom, right? And we said, of course, there's a transient response, but you also get a steady state response that survives. And in the steady state, um, the solution is, whoops, started to write the tilde too early, the, that our position, well, the thing just oscillates. But that there's a phase difference. Yeah, we're only concerned with the steady state. Like if you're talking about, uh, you know, in this class we are, because because it's just that that's the simplest approach that tells us most of the behavior. If you're looking at material with light shining on it and how it behaves, right? Unless you're looking for in the first few femtoseconds, really, um, you're in the steady state. Basically, within the first few cycles of the incoming electric field. After that, it's all steady state anyway. So that's most of the behavior. Of course, you might be interested in some particular case in the transient response, but um, we're not gonna get into that here. Uh, is, yeah, yeah, so we, we, what we're doing is our position, we're using a complex function for our position. And so what that can do is we can see that it's going to oscillate along with, it's going to oscillate along with the electromagnetic wave, but there's, it can have a phase difference too. And we'll come to that in, in our recap in just a second. So I'm going to write this out. That's an X squared. Just about to ask that. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I left out the tilde here. I see, that's what we're talking about, that. That was supposed to be a tilde. Um, so the amplitude, right? I didn't really leave enough space. That's supposed to be a Q. It's Q over M. Um, and this was in, in the last class. So that's why I'm not, I want to make sure that we have this as our starting point, but I'm not, going into as much detail. So this is the denominator right here, all underneath that. 
Um, so you can see that we've got a complex amplitude right here. So first of all, the amplitude is going to depend on the frequency, the driving frequency compared to the natural resonance frequency. And also there's going to be this phase shift that's possible. So a couple of things. First of all, this denominator, we get a zero for these two terms when you're at the resonance frequency. So your amplitude will be biggest when you're on resonance. Well, that makes sense. But you'll also get a varying phase shift. And so I let, ran out of space for, in my recap right here. But our phase shift, right, said delta phi is equal to inverse tangent of, right, basically take a look at the, the real and the imaginary parts of that denominator right there. And so it goes, if there's our delta phi, right there, and that's zero, and that's pi phase delay right there, and here's omega naught right there. This axis is omega. This goes do, 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 and starts to come up here, and then and approaches 180 degrees. Right. So <clears throat> well below the resonance frequency, right, the thing just follows the drive. But once you get <laughs> well above it, right, you'll, you'll have 180 phase degree phase uh, delay between the drive uh, and the uh, response of the system. And in between, you get some other variable phase delay like that, right? So we have electron that's going to oscillate back and forth as the field comes by, right? And so if we've got an electron that's oscillating compared to the residual, you know, the rest of the atom, the remaining ion, right, which will have, if you're starting off with a net neutral electron and the electron's going up and down, right, and you're leave, so you're leaving behind uh, a net charge of, well, the absence of one electron, so plus E. So you're creating an oscillating dipole, right, an oscillating dipole moment. So our dipole moment, just to be explicit about it, and we haven't actually explicitly written down electron, um, but, so we've just been calling it a charge, right? So this could also work for other types of systems, but mostly it's going to be an electron bound to an ion. So our dipole moment is going to be whatever that charge Q is times its displacement, which is a function of time. And that's supposed to be a tilde here. Okay. So one thing that we encounter though is in our material, right, there's lots of atoms, right? So those different electrons, they're encountering different local environments. Right? It could be that they're bound to different atoms, but it could be that the atoms are influenced by other atoms that happen to be nearby. So they could both be like, you know, silicon atoms, but could be so some of them have other atoms closer to them and other and versus some that don't. So different electrons have, right, I'm going to say different local environments. That was the sound of me drawing. So, the various atoms in there with their, with their electrons have various resonant frequencies. Ah. So instead of calling it omega naught, we're going to call it omega sub j. Right. Um, for the no, no. Um, it is the different. They're different atoms, and so each each electron will have a different resonant frequency. Or more likely, what you've got is you've got this repeating pattern. Yeah. So it's it's going to depend on on the material. So it could be like you've seen a crystal structure, and so all of the that's got like kind of a repeating pattern. So all the atoms in like if it's a you know, repeating uh, rectangles, the atoms in the lower left 
of the uh, have one resonant frequency, and it might be the same element, but then the atoms on the on the upper left and lower right are are you know different position with respect to other atoms. So they've got a slightly different resonant frequency, and the one in the upper right it might be you know a different element so it's got still a different resonant frequency but those repeat so in that particular example like there would be three different resonant frequencies you know one for the lower left uh, atom in the repeating cell a second frequency for the two uh, on the other diagonal and then a third one for the one in the upper right but so then you could divide up like 25 percent of the atoms in the material have one frequency 50% have another frequency, and 25% have a have a still a, a, a third frequency. So this frequency is for the jth electron, right? So one resonant frequency per atom, per electron, but you might have various electrons in various. So each electron has experiencing a little bit different potential. That's another way to say that. And so you notice how I just talked about having a certain fraction of the atoms, right? Because usually we have this crystal structure where you can t talk about a certain percentage are this element and ha in this local environment, and you know, another percentage are a different element, and another percentage are the same as the, the first element, but they're in a different local environment. So let's let's say that. Um, So fraction F sub J, but atoms with multiple electrons. Yeah, yeah. So, um, right, they may have more than one. Yeah, you can actually have more than one resonance. But we're, what we're going to see is we're going to be, for a given frequency, where most of the behavior is going to be determined by resonances that we're close to. Right. If you look up here, right. So uh, I, I was being a little bit over simpler oversimplifying that, that there are actually more than one resonance for all kinds of atoms. I'm also a physicist, so I often think of atoms as having one valence electron and then all the other ones are so tightly bound that you don't have to worry about them in kind of optics type experiments. But yeah, the most atoms actually have lots of valence electrons. Um, but notice right here, our behavior is going to be dominated the biggest part biggest amplitude of our oscillations is going to be when omega is close to omega naught and so omega close to omega j for a particular if there are a variety of different resonance frequencies so when for resonant frequencies that are far away from the resonant from the frequency that we're uh, sending in then they have a lot less effect and so uh, that's why i kind of you know subconsciously uh ignored it So we're going to have some fraction F sub J with that resonant frequency omega J, right? Um, oh, and also it's not just the resonant frequency, right? It'll also have um, a particular damping coefficient, gamma sub J too, right? Different atoms will have experienced different damping forces depending on what's, you know, what type of atom, but also where they are compared to other things, right? So we've got that. So they've got, and we'll also say, and uh, and we're going to have capital N, N atoms per unit volume, right? So if we talk about a fraction f sub j so the how many atoms ha in in that volume have omega j and gamma j it would be f sub j times capital n would be, give us the total with that particular condition right and so now what we can do is we can write out our polarization right um right remember our polarization is the sum of all the dipole moments so the total dipole moment per unit volume but our dipole moments are complex, so this is going to be a complex polarization, right? So here, let's write this out. P. We're just doing this in one dimension, so I'm not going to worry about the vector sign right now. So this is the total 
dipole moment. Here, I'll just to emphasize, this is a vector, right? And we're going to sum this over all of our J. Well, no, let's not sum that. We're just going to sum it over all the atoms. Oh, stop that. Um, give me one second. I somehow zoomed out, and I don't want that at all. Um, right, per unit volume. Right, and so the way we write that <clears throat> is we've got n atoms. Right, there are um, each atom has charge Q, right? And then we're going to take that um, and multiply times our dipole moment. Well, our dipole moment, if we look uh, up here, right? Our dipole moment was Q times that displacement, right? So we'll have another factor. Uh, so I'm sorry, so that's the first Q. And then the next, so then when I write out my displacement, um, it is Q over M divided by all this right here, right? And so we're gonna pick up another Q from the Q over M in my R displacement. Um, and then it was Q over M, right? <clears throat> and then we're gonna write out um, that denominator, right, with our omega, Instead of omega naught, though, we'll use omega sub j, right, minus omega squared, minus i gamma sub j omega, right? And then we have n atoms of which a fraction f sub j have that particular resonant frequency and damping condition. And then we just sum that up over are J types of atoms, right? Are we following that? Do we like that? So again, we're, what we're doing is we're just adding up all these P's right here, yeah. Do we, we're following, do we like it? We're going to see where this is going, right? <clears throat> um, but yeah, so we got all these parts right here. Um, let's see, we got to do some stuff with this right here. Uh, I should have left a little more space for this. But remember back in chapter four, right? We had um, our polarization was given by, ep, it was epsilon, but we can write that like this, epsilon times our, epsilon naught times our electric susceptibility, that's a chi, right, times the external field. So now what we're gonna do though is we, we gotta make this all complex. So now what we get is our polarization vector is complex. Epsilon naught is still a constant, but now we have a complex susceptibility times our complex driving field. So all this, why are we keeping track of the fact that it's complex? Because we have phase changes. All right, and so we're going to get do one thing, so we can write a complex permittivity. So we're going to write our complex permittivity is epsilon tilde is just epsilon naught times one plus um, our co whoa complex susceptibility. Right, and so then we can write a complex dielectric constant, which is our complex epsilon divided by epsilon naught. Oh, okay, well that just cancels out the overall epsilon naught, and so we get one plus
this right here. So, <clears throat> what is all the point of all this right here? Well, our polarization right here has this stuff built into it right here. Oh, I, I left out something right here. I'm really, really sorry. No one called, when I asked if we understood and we liked it, right? This was our polarization right here, all that stuff. Um, uh, I left out the in i'm sorry right this was all these things times x and x has this e to the i minus i omega t right there um and out another thing i left out two things this doesn't make sense at all right all this right depended on the amplitude of our driving field right for our x naught and so when we wrote out this right here, we I, what I what was still I had left out the e naught and the exponential right here that go in there. Um, so what is missing over here is this is all this right here times our driving field. It only makes sense if the polarization gets bigger when you have a bigger driving field. Right, so that's all right there. And so what this means right here is we look at this, uh, gosh. <laughs> we look at, by inspection, you look at this right here and say, well, hey, all this stuff except for the E has to be the epsilon naught times the susceptibility, right? And then, so if all this is our epsilon naught times the susceptibility, then our dielectric constant right here is one plus all of this coefficient right there. All right. So I'm going to write that over on the next page, and we'll see what that means. But we're going to I'm going to copy that over on our next page. So our dielectric constant is one plus all that coefficients there. Uh, Okay. So after all that, what, what have we ended up with? We have ended up with this. The fact that our dielectric constant is 1 plus and we had divide, had to, we were missing, we we're going to divide out that epsilon naught. Some over our J types of atoms. And there's a fraction of them in each F sub J in each of those conditions. And then here's our denominator, which we're going to see this looks a lot like the de denominators we get. We won't see this, but if you keep taking uh, physics, you'll see that when you have resonances, they often look a lot like this. Okay, so we can say a couple things. Um, first thing is, let's take a look at what happens when we're far when when we are far away from resonance. You're far away from resonance, then right omega squared minus omega sub j squared is going to be kind of big and it might be big positive big negative but it's a, a lot bigger than here we can talk about gamma sub j squared there um and so if we do that in in that situation then um our the imaginary part of the denominator doesn't contribute much
But once you start getting close to resonance, things are, are different. So close. Is uh, epsilon uh, subscript R, um, is, is that a function of omega? Yeah. So that's a big difference right here. Good point, right? So far, previously, we were just saying, oh, there's a dielectric constant, right? But it turns out, right, that is the exact, that's the point of what we're talking about right here. Dispersion is when, right, it's a function of omega. Right? So the behavior of the material, the, how the material responds to our electromagnetic wave depends on the frequency. Really important. Good stuff. Cool. All right. So let's see how what's going on right here. So we can write out the wave equation. Right. So our wave equation is right del squared of e, and we're writing this with our complex waves right here. We've got a complex permittivity. Our permeability we're saying is ah, uh, it's just the same. It's, it's it's we're going to take that to not be really much different from the vacuum value. And then here's the time part of our wave equation. So we know what, kind, what we're going to get for this. We're going to get a solution that's going to be of the form E. Um, we're just doing this in one dimension, so Z, T, complex vector with some complex vector amplitude. And then E to the I, it's got to have a complex wave number. Right, so let's write that out. which we got that from the temporal derivatives and the spatial derivatives. And so it's got to be square root of epsilon tilde mu times omega. Right, because Um, we, we are getting that uh, from a relationship with, with speeds and uh, in our wave equation right there. So the one thing to point out, though, is remembered, like Nick was pointing out, this is a function of omega. So before, k was just proportional to omega, but now it can have a more complicated relationship. And that's going to be key. More complicated relationship between omega and k. And that's why when we're, we'll have different values for our phase velocity versus the group velocity. If it was just k strictly proportional to omega, then your phase velocity and group velocity would be the same. Remember, our phase velocity is the ratio of them, and the group velocity is d omega dk. So again, our complex wave number right, has a real part and an imaginary part. Does the um, complex wave number here, does that pertain to the incident uh, electric field that's hitting our material? Um, so we've got a driving field. And so, um, so this is going to be the propagating wave, right? So you, we send in the driving field, and with the, and we're going to have a response at the driving frequency, right? So, but there can be a phase shift, um, and so that phase shift is going to cause a change in the propagation speed, 
Um, and you can have destructive interference, which will cause it to attenuate, to disappear as it goes away, right? So you send in a driving wave, and um, but as it with a certain frequency, and so you have the same frequency, but now how it propagates is going to be you know given by a k. Yes. So how it propagates through the, that medium. Yep, indeed. Okay thing. Um, yep. Yeah. So I'll. Are we concerned with this if like metals that would normally react with with radiation here are opaque? Like. Yeah. So we're gonna see. Light. Yeah. 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 So 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 they're um. Right, so so the, the, this for uh, um, we're looking at still just not necessarily metals where the electrons are free. We're looking still at at even dielectrics where our electrons are still bound to the atoms. Right, we, we saw that our metals right we have uh, a skin depth which is usually pretty short and that that describes the penetration. Here we're talking about even for for insulators where the electrons are bound to the to the atoms so they they don't just move freely absorb all the energy from the, the wave we're still going to get absorption and dispersion the the different relationships uh the different responses depending on the frequency yeah and so we're just about to get to that let's see take a look at what is the over so what does a wave look like as it propagates through Right. So if K has a real and an imaginary part, when we when we have that complex exponential down here, whoops, I'm not pointing, down here, right? This complex exponential. Let's take this complex K and separate it into its real and imaginary terms. Right. And that's going to give us the propagation and the absorption. So We've got our driving amplitude. Oops, that's supposed to be a tilde. Um, and then e to the i times i times kappa z gives us e to the minus kappa z. Right? And so that's an exponential decay. And what we're left with is the remaining e to the real part of the wave, complex wave number. So k times z, and then always minus omega i omega t. Right, and so, yeah, what we're saying is, we're getting, it's attenuated as it propagates. Cool. Um, and so this is, Right, not just in the conductor, but even in our insulator, because of the response of the of the electrons, um, their polarization. So, before we just took it all to be the same here, and, and it's specifically because of the frequency variation, right? We, why didn't we see this before? Well, before we when we looked at response of our dielectrics. We said, oh, they all, it responded the same way regardless of the frequency. Here, because there's a frequency variation, there's got to be some absorption too, some attenuation. Um, usually, we're not actually interested in the electric field, right? Usually, we measure intensity, not the electric field, right? So we know that our intensity is going to be proportional to the electric field squared, right? It's one half epsilon v elect, uh, electric field amplitude squared. So what we're going to get right here is when we square this, our intensity, right, we'll get an E naught square. We'll get everything that we had initially for our intensity. Whoa, I don't know. Pardon me. Um, so the parts, the 
parts that stay the same as the wave goes along, the E naught and the E to the I kz minus omega t, they'll all contribute just to an I naught right there. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Let me write it this way. I is equal to I naught times, when we squared it, we'll have e to the minus 2 kappa z. And so because we've got that, now the coefficient x in the exponent there is 2 kappa right here. What we're going to do is we're going to define um, in terms of that is going to de determine how quickly in space that intensity drops off right? because intensity is the electric field amplitude squared or proportional to it it's going to drop off twice as fast as the electric field amplitude drops off so we're going to call that right there an absorption coefficient alpha, which we're just going to define to be 2 kappa. Because of the material, yeah, because of the fact that we a, um, it drops off fast. Well, it doesn't have to be. No, I mean, so this could be much, much, it's going to be much, much slower than in, say, a conductor, right? A conductor, you're going to get, you know, skin depths comparable to the wavelength, right? Here, you can go through, for example, you can go through several meters of seawater before you drop, the intensity drops by uh, a factor of, of E, as in E, like that, right? So, it is like orders of magnitude different, but it still counts for the absorption as you propagate through the material. And if there was some sort of resonance, like for example, you can send a laser light through a gas of rubidium, say. Just I'm picking that because that's what I work with. And if you're far off resonance, a little beam will go through with just a little bit of loss. But as you approach resonance, you can get a very, very large alpha, lots of absorption, and it will drop off quickly, right? Because of this right here. When omega is close to the resonance, then this right here is very small. So this fraction right here gets very big. And so this gets really big and yeah, stuff like that. So um, let's see. Let's No, you want to be away from resonance to make it last. So a big absorption coefficient means that that a very short z will give you a, a, a attenuation by a factor of e. Right? Big absorption coefficient, rapid absorption, wave doesn't last very long, far. So close to resonance, small denominator, big epsilon, so big part right here, so big this right here in particular, right? Because it's dominated, I'm sorry, I wasn't pointing, big epsilon. And this part, the real part is very small. You're left with almost entirely imaginary parts. So big kappa if you're near resonance. So big alpha, big absorption coefficient, which means you don't go very far before the wave has been absorbed significantly. Far from resonance, not much absorption. Right. Um, Let's see, uh, we can do a little bit with this right here. Um, let's see if I have enough space here. I'm just trying to decide. Uh, now let's, I'm gonna move some of this stuff. I'm gonna take a picture and, and start a new page. Give me a second. Okay, so let's take a look at, at the 
wave as it goes through. Um, let's specifically, we can write out the phase velocity. Right, that's going to be V equals omega over K, right? Um, and so we can take a look at, we're doing this. to find out what's going on with our index of refraction. Why? Because our phase velocity is what determines the index of refraction. So n is equal to c over v, right, because v equals c over n. So then I can write this is going to be c k over omega, right? And then from that, I can do some rearrangement k is equal to omega over c times n. And so generalize that. And we can relate our complex wave number to a complex index of refraction. Right? And our comp oh, our complex index of refraction, though, is, if you remember, our index of refraction it's just the square root of our dielectric constant. But now this is complex. So let's see what that says then. Um, we're going to then say k, right? We had written, uh, we had our dielectric uh, coefficient before. So I'm going to rewrite that right now. It was on one of our previous pages, right? So it was 1 plus, oh, and the omega c out front. Omega c out front. We're taking the square root of all these things, but um, if, if each of these resonances are small, For example, a small fraction of the atoms or things like that, then we can just keep the linear term. Well, the linear and the constant. Keep just through the linear term in a Taylor co expansion. All right, so I'm going to keep, I'm going to go back in and, and write this. So we're going to make this an approximation. It was the square root of one plus that the whole big term. Um, but this, if if that is a small, the the second term is small, then we can write this as just one half of that. So basically, do the binomial approximation. So we're going to just add a one half factor to this small term. And then we don't have to take the square root. We're just doing a Taylor expansion. And then we have the rest of it, the sum over j, the fraction of type j, Right, and rather than taking the square root, we've done the Taylor approximation with this one half right there. Okay, ugly, definitely ugly. One of the things when you're working with these complex numbers, is we really don't like having uh, complex numbers in the denominator. It's kind of like having square square roots in the denominator. Um, we don't like that. So the trick to get rid of that, um, we can make the denominator real.
by the complex conjugate. Blah. All right, so let's let's write that out. Saying is our complex wave vector, and we've still made this an approximation. Still have the omega c out front. Haven't done anything to this one. <clears throat> we can keep the coefficients out front. All right, and now we're entering into the equation. And still have this coefficient right here. When we multiplied through by the complex conjugate, then we get the real part. The real part there gets squared minus the imaginary part. I mean, sorry, plus the imaginary part squared, because we'll have a minus i times a plus i, which gives us a plus gamma sub j squared, omega squared. But in order to multiply the denominator by the complex conjugate, we also have to multiply the numerator by the complex conjugate. So that is omega sub j squared minus omega squared plus, because it's the complex conjugate, i gamma j omega. Right? And so what was the point of all that? <laughs> um, point was to make it so that this denominator is purely real. And once we do that, then we can just look at the numerator and separate it into real and imaginary parts. Why? Right. So the reason for doing that, the reason why we want to separate it, is our behavior is really determined. Oops, something just pinged. To get real k. Yeah, we want the real k and the imaginary kappa, right? Right, is the real k plus the imaginary kappa. And when we had complex numbers in the denominator, there was no easy way to split it up. But when they're in the numerator, you just cleave it, right? Right here. It makes that sound too when you separate it, right? So um, then the real part, right, because Again, n equals ck over omega, so n, oops, so here, let's, so that's basically we, the, the c over omega cancels out the omega over k, and so we just are left with the one plus all those coefficients, our summation, and, oh, And then all this, we take just the real part, so f sub j, and then times the omega j squared minus j squared, like that. And then, um, didn't want this, right, our alpha is our absorption coefficient. That's the thing that we actually measure. That's twice kappa, two times kappa. So then we do that and, um, okay, if we looked again down here, the one was, the, was real. So the imaginary part's just gonna have the, within that second term in the summation and the i gamma j omega part right there. So this is approximately equal to n q squared. Oh, and we left out, there was still the omega out front. Um, and I'm gonna pull out the omega that's inside the summation too. So what am I saying? We had this out front and I'm gonna factor out this omega right here. So this omega and that omega give us the omega squared. Um, and this was, the factor of two cancels out the factor of two, so we get m epsilon naught, and then we have to, from the coefficients out front, we have a c in the denominator too, 
and then take all this, sum this over j. Um, we've got this coefficient, and then the gamma sub j, and then all that over the denominator. So let's see a couple things about these things about these. Um, oh, and I had meant to write these in earlier. So let's take a look first for um, n. Yeah, let's do that one first. I'll put that right here. So what happens as we go from below resonance to above resonance? Well, okay, what we're saying is when omega squared is smaller, this is positive, and then when omega, when it gets bigger than omega sub j, then this overall term here becomes negative right there. Oh, but I forget about the denominator. Look at the numerator, right? The denominator, we're always adding some positives on right here. But up here, right, when omega is, when we're below resonance, omega is smaller than omega sub j, so this whole term is positive. When you're above the resonance, then omega squared is bigger than omega sub j, so this goes negative, right? So, or at least that term in the summation. Whoa, my goodness. The denominator always, um, so long as there's sufficient damping. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think in most normal materials, the answer is yes, but um, you could get weird pathological situations. There are always pathologies. Um, so here, I'm going to put a little carrot in here, the n, right? So we want to be may go negative, but then there are other resonances too, right? There are other terms in the summation. And so you may be overall positive, right? Um, uh, and they may win out, um, but it's still, it's possible to have a right near resonance, have a little bit of of, of negative index of refraction, which mean a negative speed and stuff like that. That seems really weird, right? Mo let's see why we don't usually see it all that much. And it has to do with this term right here, the second term. I should have just written these. I'm sorry about the bad layout right here. What happens as we pass near resonance? Well, as we're near a resonance with this one right here, right, this term gets really small. So what happens is, if your denominator overall gets relatively small, then your numerator, then your overall term gets really, really big. So you get a lot of absorption right near that area. Right, you get peak in absorption. So we can actually make a plot of what's going on right here. Um, so remember, n is one plus all this stuff. So I'm gonna, when I sketch this out, I'm gonna draw n minus one, so we don't have to worry about that overall factor of one, right there, all, overall one sum. All right, so let's make a plot of this. Um, so I'm gonna do two different curves here. Um, 
first curve is going to be the n. Oh, all right, that's red. So here, let's do n, actually n minus 1 first. So that the term in the summation, right, as you get closer and closer to resonance, oh, so this is, I'm plotting omega on this axis. And right here, this is omega sub j right there is at that point. So it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, except then you cross from positive to negative. And then that extra term got gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so what I'm plotting right here, though, is n minus 1, because it was always 1 plus that extra term. So that extra term is bigger and bigger and positive until you cross resonance. And right as you cross resonance, it goes negative and then quickly gets big but negative and then drops off to zero. Meanwhile, our absorption starts out small when you're far from resonance and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it hits a maximum at resonance and then as you pass away from resonance, it drops off. So what we're seeing, a couple things. Um, so just overall, right, our index of refraction, it's gradually increasing everywhere, except right near that resonance, right? Because I've got this blown up so that the area near the resonance takes up a lot of the graph, but actually that's a fairly narrow thing. How narrow? Depends on the gamma. Um, so everywhere, so everywhere here, let me just write this. All right, resonance, sorry. Um, so, right, if we look, it's gradually increasing from way, 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 way out to the left, keeps gradually increasing. And then here, it's also gradually increasing as we go forever out, out, out. It's only in this region right here, right near the resonance where it's actually decreasing. And so that's called, um, anomalous dispersion. near the reds, right? It's usually n increases with omega, except right near the resonance. And so dispersion is a change in uh, our index of refraction, change in our properties with frequency. So generally, it's increasing, but the behavior is anomalous right near the uh, there, uh, right near the resonance. And so, right, we can even, have S and 1, so that would mean V greater than C. Well, just the phase velocity. We said that's not the same as information propagation speed. Um, and in fact, there's actually a fairly active research field where people control absorption, um, sometimes by sending in another, uh, another field another like a laser field that makes it so that right near the center of the absorption peak, you actually get transmission, right? So that's um, called electromagnetically induced transparency. And so, but it turns out then if you're changing how absorption behaves as a function of frequency, then you're also gonna change the index of refraction. So you're gonna change the speed of light in the material at that near that point too. Right, so it turns out, let's write some of this down, right? So it's called electromagnetically, here, this is just an example, electromagnetically induced
transparency, sometimes called EIT, right? It's related to slow and fast light, where people are controlling these things. What we're saying is those, right, they came from, well, you could look at it and say, well, hey, those were just two different terms, right, in, the, in that expression for our complex, that we got from our complex wave vector. You know, maybe those two terms can vary independently. Why do they have to be related? Um, and that's something um, that requires a bit more math than we have right here. But this is what's known as the kramers kronig uh, relation for the real and the imaginary parts of that complex wave function. Um, and because of that, has anyone taken complex analysis here? I would be surprised, but has Jake taken complex analysis or now? I'm taking it. You're right now. Did you, have you mentioned Kramer's Kronig relations? In class? No, class not yet. No, it's okay. The, yeah, it, it, it depends. But so if you have a uh, function that's analytic in the upper half of the complex plane, there's has to be a relationship between its real and imaginary parts. That's what this is right here. So a relationship between K and kappa uh, in, in this particular case. And, and part of the reason why, so it, it's really interesting Invoking these and invoking the necessity of causality is where you can get the full relationship between alpha and n. So it's kind of cool, like complex analysis, math, right? But linked with the idea of causality is a necessary step um, uh, to actually get these. So I like that a lot. Um, there's so. Uh, I was going to show you the relationship between group velocity also, but I think we're gonna be short on time. So I'm gonna, let's just conclude with a, a little bit about how this relates to actual materials right here. So, um, yeah. Mm, adjustable tint, I don't think so. That must be something else. I, that, I don't know what that is. Um, we'll have to. I'm, I'd have to look into that, and we'll have to do it after class. I have to sneeze first. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Sorry. <laughs> Ambulance windows. Do they like flip a switch and they do that? Ooh, I wonder if that's like an LCD type thing. Frost or not frost? I wonder if that's like an LCD type effect, like a liquid crystal. Um, with polarizers and you're adjusting the, and you're rotating the polarization in, in the space in between or not. Transition, yeah, all right, so that's another thing. That's, it's, it's so EIT is, is an, a coherent effect, it relies on interference. So those are something else. There might, it's not the same as electromagnetically induced transparency, but it obviously, but it's obviously relating to all these types of things. Yeah, yeah. I don't know all the details of that. That's really. I'll have to look. I think like if you look up Vision Works, they tell you how it works pretty well, because the, it's the same stuff they use for glasses. So right, okay, and so so those d depend on um, UV light. I know because I was, you know, I, I getting to the age where. Well, actually, I'm going to start needing reading glasses, but before that, I needed driving glasses, um, which I hadn't beforehand. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should get some transition glasses. They're like, uh, you're using these for driving, right? Like, and I said, yeah, well, they're not going to work. It's the UV that uh, darkens, causes them to darken. And when you're the auto glass, right, blocks the UV, so they wouldn't darken in your car all that much. So, um, oh, um, for the electronic ones, yeah, it uses a um, 
positive charged particles darken the tint, and then when you send through a negative charge, it lightens the tint. I want yeah. So I don't know how that it must be somehow reconfiguring some some molecule within there. So for for um, LCDs where you apply a voltage and you the crystals uh, the molecules rotate from uh, the front one, front of the screen to the back of the screen and that rotates the polarization. Um, and without the voltage, they all just stay aligned like this and that. Um, and so you can get you you can use cross polarizers and that or or aligned polarizers. And so if you rotate the polarization, it will either block or allow through the light or vice versa. Um, let's just take a look at, at at how this behaves in kind of normal materials, and then we can do some more research on non-normal materials. Um, so a lot of the time. Uh, and I'm going over. Um, let me just, I, this will just take us a minute or two. Right, we're usually dealing with situations where the wave is below the resonant frequency. Um, so then for all the, for those functions, what we do is you do a Taylor expansion. And um, we write this as omega over omega j. Um, and so th that this is a small quantity right there. And so you do all that, and you get n is about equal to 1 plus, And you can write it this way. And this is just purely an empirical factor, I mean, formulation that we can get from, you know, <laughs> the pr from the expressions we were using before. Um, and so this is called Cauchy's formula. Ah. If you're doing, I'm pretty sure it's the same Cauchy that whose name comes up again and again and again in analysis, complex analysis. Um, so what we call A is um, called the coefficient of refraction. Square root of negative shit. What? Complex. Complex analysis is one of these things. It's like sounds seems very very abstract and theoretical, but it has all kinds of really important applications in signal processing and stuff like that. Yeah. Shit. Oh, yep. I've seen that joke. Right, the B term is how it varies. And notice that this is written out in terms of lambda uh, instead of uh, omega. So lambda is proportional to the reciprocal of omega. Um, so here, so A again is how much you're deviating from uh, the index of refraction of one, which is what it would be in empty space. And then B gives you the rate at which it's gonna change with wavelength squared rather than uh, with frequency. So here, I'm gonna, what I'd like to do is, I'm sorry, I'm once again over. Um, let me just show you what this looks like uh, in glass. Just give me a second, someone's saying something, but I can't see it. Uh, your shit got real. This is memorialized forever. Uh, ooh, what? It. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know the the joys of notation. Let me just show you this picture, and then we'll be out of here. Jam post. Where did it go? Um, it's gone. Coming back.
seems only a little bit your fault. All right, the the window closed, so now I can share it again. Uh, application window here. All right, so we can see that as lambda increases, right, this goes as one over lambda squared. All right, so you can see um, us it falling down woo, right here going down. And so this is for a particular kind of glass, BK's borosilicate glass, uh, BK7. So you can see it's dropping down um, as one over lambda squared, roughly. And here's the Cauchy equation. Here's the data. And actually, so this Selmeyer, this is a, a more complete model. And it's a model that obviously does a better job of explaining what's going on right here. right? But the Cauchy equation does a pretty good job for most of it. I think Cauchy is one of these people like Gauss and, and Newton and, and who's all over the place. So it's not the same as the stretch. What is the red shading in this case? I don't remember. I got this off of, of uh, so oh, the red shading, what is the red shading? Anyone tell me what the red shading is? I know what it is. What is this red shading right here? Here's a hint, look down at the axis, from here to there. Visible light, right? So this is the visible room. So in the visible, the Cauchy equation does a, actually a reasonable job of explaining what's going on. But once you get to farther out into the infrared, you got to use this more complete model, which you would think actually would do even, the Cauchy equation was a limit for omega much less than the resonant frequency. So you think it would do a better job for low frequency, so long wavelength, and you know, worse job up here, but apparently not. Right? But again, remember, even when we began, like this was a really simple model, just saying every electron's bound like an harmonic oscillator. That's not necessarily the case either. Cool. All right, we're gonna stop here. We're gonna um, Next class, I'm going to just tell you the idea behind um, waveguides, but then we're going to talk about the Chapter 10 stuff. Um, okay, cool. I'll talk with Camille after everyone else heads out. But I'll see you in the next class. Remember, start the homework. Take a look at it. If you can... Yeah, and I will see you in the next class. Take care.